So hello everybody and welcome to the uh, latest uh, Lalamand We Brew With You uh, online webinar. Uh, my name is Andrew Patterson and I'm the uh, technical sales representative for the UK and Scandinavia and today I'm going to be going over how to use dried yeast to restart your brewery uh, post COVID-19 lockdown. So I know uh, in many countries of the world, this, this won't yet be a reality. You'll still be uh, locked down, um, but certain other countries are now starting to uh, get moving again. And certainly in the UK, the pubs are starting to open again on the 4th of July, something which I am very much looking forward to, and I'm sure you are as well. So today I'm going to go over why I think dried yeast is perfect for this purpose. Now, I'm going to do this in a format similar to a presentation which my colleague Brittany did uh, a few weeks ago, maybe even months now, um, where she did it as a question and answer format, because I really liked the way that went. So to start with, I'm going to go over our production process just briefly. Then I'm going to go over the, uh, the key points which I think make dry yeast perfect for, for restarting your brewery post lockdown. Uh, and then I'm going to go over what you should consider when you choose a dried strain to restart your brewing process. Basically, I'm going to look at all the different characteristics of yeast and, and what you need to be aware of when you choose it and how you need to set your fermentation parameters to get the correct result. So to start with, my first question, what is active dried yeast? So this is one that I don't think many people understand. A lot of people think that it's uh, freeze dried, um, which it's not. Um, active dried yeast is a yeast cell in which 90% of the moisture has been removed. It's in a sort of dormant state, so to speak, um, but it isn't freeze dried and it's not inactive. It's a 100% fully metabolically active cell. It's just in a dormant state and it can stay like that for a very long time. Um, all you need to do is rehydrate it and then once it takes in moisture, uh, it starts to, to ferment like any normal yeast would. Oh, I've got somebody here for India. So, uh, hello, India. I'm glad that you're here. Um, so, just to start with, I'm going to go over a little bit of how uh, dried yeast is produced. Um, so, I'll just go over that first, uh, kind of verbally, and then I'll show you a quick diagram because I like to see a diagram of uh, how things, how these things work. So, what we do is we we take our yeast um, from the culture collection that we have in in Montreal, and we'll send it to our uh, yeast production sites. Um, we have many around the world, but most of our brewing yeasts are produced in, in Vienna, in Austria, um, on the same site as the Otterkringer Brewery. And what we'll do is we'll take that plant of yeast and we'll add it to a small flask of fermentable uh, material. Um, it's not wort, it's actually made from molasses. Um, and we'll do a batch step and we'll do this three times. So we'll end up with a, a ever increasing size of uh, yeast. Uh, kind of biomass. So you'll go from one smaller flask up into a large one and then up into a large one. And then following that point, we'll pitch that yeast into a very large uh, fed batch fermenter and we'll feed the batch with nutrients and with minerals and with sugars uh, and lots of air to create a, an aerobic kind of uh, growing environment which will allow us to increase that biomass until we've got a, 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 a very high concentration of yeast. And at that point, we will stress the, uh, stress the yeast. Um, and I'll go into that later because that's a very important part of the process. We'll then uh, centrifuge the yeast. So we'll remove some of the moisture in that way. We'll then wash it as well because uh, the yeast can look a little bit um, dark in color uh, post, post first stage of um, propagation. So we'll wash it and it will speak of this nice kind of cream color afterwards. And we'll then uh, send it to the next stage of drying, which is called a, a rotary vacuum filter. And what this is, is basically a very large drum on which you spread yeast on the outside and a vacuum is applied to that drum. Oh, not yet, Nasty. Go back to me speaking. <laughs> um, and this will start to pull some of that moisture out of the yeast. Um, and at the same time as the drum rotates, there's a, there's a knife on one side of it and it cuts the layer of dried yeast from the surface of the drum. And you end up with... Um, it kind of looks like curls of dried yeast, almost like if you were making making bread and you used a, a, a dough scraper across the surface of, of your worktop. You'd get this kind of like skim of yeast some cells coming off, off the surface. And it looks very much like that, kind of long curled wraps of, of yeast. Following this, it goes through what we call an extruder plate, which is basically a plate with very small holes in it. So it's pumped through this plate and it creates long strings of kind of spaghetti. 
um, which, which will then be dried further in the next stage, which is a fluidized bed dryer. So you get these big, long strings of spaghetti, and they're kind of, you know, it's a little bit moist, they kind of fold together. Um, and we put them in this big tank, and it pumps warm air into the bottom, and it keeps it nicely agitated, and then it starts to dry out. Um, and this is how we get the yeast down to its final 90% uh, uh, dry, dry matter. So I'm just going to go now and look at the diagram so we can see that. So can you bring up the diagram, please, Natalie? There we go. So this, this is just kind of visualizing everything that I just said. So you've got your first laboratory stage uh, cultures. Uh, you then go into a fed batch uh, kind of reactor. Uh, you then have your separator, your washing tank, and your second separator. Uh, before next going into the rotary vacuum filter, and then on into the fluidized bed dryer. It's quite a simple process, but it's, it's actually really enjoyable to go around these sides and just see how it all works. So you'll remember before that I mentioned that we stress the yeast, um, and this sounds bad, I'll give you that, it sounds bad, it sounds like something we shouldn't be doing, but actually this is very important uh, from, from the perspective of drying the yeast, because it allows the yeast to survive the drying process. Now this is a, um, a chemical that is produced by the yeast when we stress it and it's called trehalose. So just to start with, I'm going to show you what the cell membrane looks like in a yeast cell before we dry it. So this is your cell membrane and you can see you've got phospholipids in a, in a bilayer, that just means there's two layers of phospholipids. You've got the hydrophilic heads and then you've got the hydrophobic tails. And normally, under, under normal conditions, this uh, membrane is stabilized by water molecules so you can see in a second you'll see that the um the water molecules um are between the phospholipid heads uh, and they stabilize the membrane and keep it nice and fluid uh during the uh the normal kind of activities of a yeast cell now when you start to dry the yeast then uh, th this water starts to leave and you'll start to get what we have like a really kind of unordered uh, structure of the cell wall, which is prone to rupture and breaking. And that's not very good for the yeast. So we want to avoid this as, as we dry the cells. So what, what happens is that we create this trehalos in the stressing process, and that fills the gap that the water uh, leaves when, it is, uh, when the yeast is dehydrated. So you end up with a process like this, where you have the um, trehalose mole molecules in between the uh, phospholipid heads, and it keeps that membrane nice and fluid. And actually, uh, on, a, on a dried brewing yeast, the trihalos can actually form up to 15 to 20% by weight of the dry matter that's in the product. So it's a very important part of, of dried yeast. Now, one of the things with dried yeast is that because it has this requirement for, for very high levels of trihalos, not all dry, uh, brewing yeasts can be dried because they have to be able to produce this chemical in very large quantities. So it's one of the reasons there are less dried yeasts available on the market is because it's very important for this uh, trihalose sugar to be reproduced. And that's actually something I forgot to mention is that this is actually a sugar. So if I go back, you can see the structure of the sugar. It's a disaccharide uh, made up of two glucose molecules. Um, interestingly, that's actually uh, a sugar source for the yeast as well. So as it's uh, it's stored, it can actually use that yeast as a sugar source for, for, for growth. So next question, um, can we go back to my face, please, Natalie? Excellent, thank you. So what makes dry yeast good for restarting a brewery? We've seen the uh, the production process now, and we've seen the importance of trihalos in stabilizing the cell membrane. So I'd like to go over what I think makes dry yeast particularly good for restarting a brewery. So I think, uh, I'm sure you'll agree, um, particularly in the UK, um, but the restart process from, from COVID is gonna be quite fraught with uncertainty. So we don't know, how long areas of the country are going to be allowed to open for. We don't know whether areas of the country are going to be able to shut down temporarily for extra periods of time. So it's important that you have a solution in the brewery which is flexible. And this is one of the great things about dry yeast because it's got that very high trihalose content. It uh, has a very long shelf life. So up to two years, we can keep our dry yeast 
um, without it going bad, without it going off, just in a cold room. Um, so you can keep it there. And if you need to start up production suddenly, uh, or you can't maintain a, a wet culture because you can't repitch because you're not brewing often enough, you can fall back on your dry yeast and you can just get it out and it'll be good to go whenever you need it. Now, the second thing I think is is, is quite important, uh, and, and certainly, uh, especially now when all these breweries are going to be coming online all at once, is that we have uh, dry yeast readily available. So we have very large fermenters and we create large batches of our dry yeast at once. So we have it in storage, so it's ready to go. We can get it to large numbers of breweries very quickly without having to worry about bottlenecks in the propagation process. It's always there. Next, uh, we have a full portfolio of strains. So I did mention before that the trihalose content is very important. And uh, if you don't have enough trihalose there, then the strain doesn't dry very well. Well, at Lalaman, we're always looking for dry strains that we can uh, produce or strains that we can produce in dry format. And at this point in time, we have a full portfolio of strains. So we've got the strain that you need to create the style of beer that you want to create. Um, everything from uh, like a West Coast IPA strain and East Coast IPA strain to a Kolsch. We, we've got pretty much you covered for any beer style that you wish to create. And number four of, of my, my top tips to so use dry yeast to restart your brewery is how repitchable it is. So we have the benefit of a very long shelf life on our dry yeast, which means we can do an awful lot of quality control testing on the yeast. Uh, and this means that it's of a high enough quality that you can repitch it multiple times. Um, so I know breweries that repitch our strains up to six times with great success. And there's no reason you couldn't go higher if you were subsequently, uh, if, sorry, if you were adequately um, uh, adding nutrients to your fermentations. So it's repitchable and you can turn it on whenever you like and we've always got yeast in stock. So I think it's perfect. So let's let's imagine that you've chosen dried yeast and you're going to restart your brewery using some dried yeast. Maybe you're going to replace a strain that you had uh, going for a very long time before that. What are the things that you should consider uh, when you go to do that? So Natalie, could you bring up my presentation again, please? Thank you very much. So I have here a Lalamand specification sheet. So each of our strains has one of these sheets. And these are very useful to you, um, very useful in you know, looking, looking at the characteristics of the strain and, and, and deciding what you need to uh, take into account when you, when you pick a yeast to do a new beer with or to emulate a beer that you've already done. So, at the top right of the stray, uh, of the sheet, there's the uh, the flavour wheel, and this is probably the most important thing to look at first. This will give you an idea of the overall character of a particular yeast strain. So whether it's particularly fruity, whether it's more neutral, whether it produces some acid, that sort of thing. Um, and it's really the best place to start. Underneath that, we have quick facts, which will give you an idea of what the uh, the flavour wheel already told you. So the kind of beers that this yeast is. Uh, particularly suited to making. So in this case, uh, this is actually a, a data sheet for our Kolsch yeast, our Kolsch strain. Uh, and you can see from our quick facts, we've recommended Kolsch style ales or neutral ales. So it kind of, you know, it does what it says. And that, that's what you're going to be using for those types of beer. Next, we have attenuation. So if you look to the, uh, where is it on there? It's the, the third one down on the data sheet. So, Attenuation uh, is something that I get asked a lot about with uh, with brewing yeast strains, and you can broadly categorise these into into three separate categories. So we have uh, a low medium kind of uh, attenuating yeast strain, uh, probably a medium high attenuating yeast strain, and then a very high attenuating yeast strain. Now people always ask me to put numbers on the attenuation of the yeast, and it's not very easy to do uh, for the simple reason that yeast attenuation would vary to a great degree depending on the matching condition. So if you were to match at very high temperatures, you might end up with uh, a, a lower attenuation. Uh, and if you match at very low temperatures, you might end up with a higher attenuation. But what we can do is sort these strains into, you know, medium, low and high, depending on their various characteristics. So a low attenuating yeast strain, I would suggest, would probably be in the region of 65 to 75% attenuation. And that's likely to be uh, an old English kind of ale strain. So if you're using an old English ale strain, we do have strains that will attenuate in a similar fashion. And um, those are our Windsor and our London strains. 
and they're probably going to give you 65 to 75 percent attenuation uh, next we have medium high and this would probably include most ale strains so most american ale strains most german ale strains are probably in a medium high attenuation range uh, and this would probably be something that i'd put down as a number of 75 to 85 percent just as a guideline um, it should be noted that if your regular strain is, is high or medium attenuating or low attenuating, if you don't change the mashing conditions and you use one of our strains that is either low or medium high attenuating, you're not likely to see the attenuation change too much. Um, finally, then we have the uh, the high attenuating strains, and this is really um, only Saison strains that are going to be very high. Um, so at, at that point, I'm talking probably 85 to 95% attenuation. Uh, so if you've got a Saison strain, to be honest with you, they're all, they're all pretty much like that. So uh, if you were to pick our Saison strain, you, you're likely going to have a very high attenuation. The next one to look at is, uh, is flocculation. So as I'm sure you're aware, all brewing strains flocculate very differently. And uh, certainly it depends on the type of uh, equipment that you operate as per the problem this could cause you. So um, if you're operating uh, a centrifuge or you have the benefit of large amounts of time, then perhaps you can uh, make do with a strain that is uh, of quite low flocculation characteristics. On the other hand, if you're producing uh, beers and you don't have a centrifuge or you're producing in the UK, for instance, cast scales, you're going to look for a strain that uh, flocculates in a, in a similar fashion to what you're used to. So if you're used to handling strains that are of medium or low attenuative properties, you might be able to handle it, but if you're used to using a strain in car scale that's uh, very flocculent, then that is something that you want to, 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 to stick with, because if you're not used to it, you might find that you get real problems from yeast strains that are, that are poorly attenuate, uh, sorry, poorly flocculated. So that's written on our data sheet as well. Um, next, we have ethanol tolerance. Now, I think this is an interesting one. You know, I think most of the time, unless you're going to be producing very high alcohol beers, this isn't going to be too much of an issue for you. Most of our brewing yeast strains will attenuate to at least 9%, uh, and some will go much higher than that. But it is something to take into account if you're, say, high gravity brewing or if you're producing imperial stouts or the like. Um, so definitely something that you want to uh, pay attention to. So those are the standards. Um, then finally, I'm going to talk about pitching rate and temperature, because all of the... Uh, the characteristics that I've already mentioned can pretty much be uh, manipulated using these two characteristics. So let's say you've got a strain that you want to use and it's a little bit neutral um, according to our, our flavor wheel. You can actually uh, modify the strain's behavior by changing the temperature or the pitching rate. So if you wanted to say increase the kind of fruity character of a neutral strain, one of the things you could do would be to increase the temperature. So fermenting at a higher temperature will always give you a greater amount of esters being formed. These are the kind of flavors that give you very fruity characteristics in beer, uh, as well as higher alcohols, which are giving you kind of a warmer uh, kind of fermentation characteristic, a bit more of a boozy character. So these are things that, that you can manipulate uh, using uh, temperature, but you can also manipulate these using uh, pitching rate. So you could pitch at a lower rate if you were trying to increase esters. So it's been shown that pitching at a lower uh, rate will increase these esters due to, uh, due to more yeast growth. So that's a, another way in which you could increase that estery character, uh, even if you were using a neutral strain. You can, you know, it can work the other way as well. So let's say you were using a, a particularly estery yeast, but you wanted it to be more neutral in character. You could ferment it at a lower temperature or you could use a higher pitching rate. So it works both ways. And what I would really recommend to you is if you are using a yeast to do this, um, that you speak to your Lalleman representative because they will have uh, experience of, of breweries doing these things and they'll be able to point you in the right direction important as well but if you are manipulating these characters that you don't go below our recommended limit so if for instance you're producing a, a yeast uh, a beer and you wanted to pitch on the lower side with that yeast because you wanted to create a more estuary character that's absolutely fine but still don't go below our minimum recommended pitching rate because that can cause other problems you know you might end up with a more estuary beer but you might also end up with a beer that doesn't fully attenuate uh, and doesn't finish fermenting so you know it's um it swings and roundabouts as with brewing in 
in any context, you, you've always got to play with the different parameters that you've got at your disposal to get the, the right outcomes. So always ask us uh, what, what is best, um, but this will give you some idea of how to uh, read the data sheet and how to um, uh, use this to, to, to use uh, dry yeast in your, in your brewery post COVID. So that's kind of me on the uh, presentation front. What I'd like to do is open this up for uh, questions and answers. So you can ask me questions about our yeast. So I'm looking at Facebook, there's a bit of a lag. So if you do type your question, uh, it might take me 10 seconds or so to see it. But once I see it, I'll do my very best to answer it. So no questions yet. I'm starting to feel lonely out here. Oh, that's a great question. That's the one I get all the time. Thanks, Chris. <laughs> so uh, is it always necessary to rehydrate? Uh, in short, no, but with uh, some caveats. So what we say to most brewers is if they're happy uh, brewing with our yeasts and they're not rehydrating and they're getting good results, then continue doing it in that fashion and don't worry about rehydrating. Where I would perhaps change my advice is where we're using strains in particularly um, harsh environments. So if you're doing uh, a very strong beer, say at very high gravity, you're doing imperial stout, that might be worth rehydrating. Um, or if you're doing uh, sour beers, so you have a, a low pH, anything really that's gonna make it harder for that yeast cell to rehydrate well uh, when it's pitched directly into the wort. So if you're doing beers with those particular characteristics, I would recommend rehydration. But if not, and if you're happy with the way the yeast strain is performing, then you don't need to worry about it. So I've got a question here from Andy Parker. Hi, Andy. Good to hear from you. Uh, so can you tell us more about the new sour strain, please? So this is our new Philly sour strain. Um, which is a Lahantia species. Uh, very excited uh, to get that out in the market. Um, brand new. Um, so it's a really exciting yeast strain, isolated by the University of Sciences in Philadelphia. And it's a Lahantia species. And what it does is it produces lactic acid as it ferments uh, from simple sugars. So at the start of fermentation, before jumping into the maltotriose and the maltose, what it will do is it will take the glucose and it will start to produce lactic acid. Uh, and in doing so, it will produce a sour beer. And one of the great benefits of this strain is that it foregoes the need for a kettle souring step. So you can send your wort straight into your fermenter. You can add your uh, Philly sour and it will start to sour. And then after that, it will start to ferment. Uh, you also can use hops very easily with this strain. So if you were trying to use bacteria in the fermenter before, which sometimes people did, you wouldn't have been able to add hops. But in the case of Philly sour, you can because it's hop tolerant. Um, really excited to see the strain out on the market, and I'm really looking forward to trying some more beers made with it. Andy Benson, I've got, I've got a tricky one here. Rehydration of active dried yeast um, with fermentus, oops, sorry, with, with marketing of the ETU, what are the advantages of rehydration and the effects on fermentation performance and sensory analysis? So I think that's, that's kind of one I already went through a bit of. Um, what we find is that there isn't a great deal of difference in the fermentation uh, if you were to rehydrate the strain. But as I said before, with, with the caveat that if you're pitching that yeast into a particularly harsh environment, then you do want to rehydrate the strain. So if it's going into a very low pH or a very high sugar content, then it's worth it. Um, you sort of just see a slightly faster fermentation. But other than that, there isn't a great deal of difference. Sarah Young, how many degrees C would you increase the fermentation by to increase the uh, ester characteristic? So that's actually probably strain dependent. Now, what you see in some lager yeasts uh, and, and most of the kind of academic research that's done and published is, is done in lager yeast, primarily because it's 
you know, it's the, it's the big seller in the world. Everybody makes lager if you look at the volume. Um, actually, you see uh, almost a 70% increase in, in esters uh, with a one degree rise in temperature. So actually, it, it doesn't need to be a great deal uh, of an increase in temperature before you see quite a, a large increase. Obviously, 70% of not very much <laughs> it is, is, you know, <laughs> you have to take that into consideration. But um, you don't need to go a lot higher to create a lot more esters. So let's say you were talking about an AOL strain. Maybe you would go from, say, 20 to 23, and you might see a significant increase in the ester profile. Eric Harding, what percentage of your yeasts are available in homebrew size packets versus pro only? Um, so all of them are available in homebrew size, apart from the Sour Vizier, as far as I'm aware, which is the um, the GMO uh, uh, sour strain that we produce only in the US market. Everything else is available in 11 gram sachet. Jan Maria, could you tell us a bit more about transportation during these hot days and the benefits on, of, uh, of this on active dried yeast? Um, well, Jan Maria, I, I admire your optimism. Um, right now in the UK, it's pouring with rain and it's very cold. Um, but as you say, uh, our yeast is transported out of Austria and it goes all over the world from there. So it's going through some very warm countries. And at this time of year, we will ship our yeast in refrigerated transport so that there's never any harm to the active dried yeast. Um, as I mentioned before, these yeasts are alive, they're not inactivated, so they do need to be kept cold. Um, so if you take them into your brewery, please do keep them in a cold room, um, especially if, if you're in a very warm country. Um, ambient in the UK in winter is probably fine. So I've got a question here about blending of yeast strains. Um, uh, talking about uh, blending New England with USO5. Uh, are other breweries doing this? And if so, what strains are they mixing? Um, so yes, many breweries do this, uh, and many of them do it to uh, kind of take an effect that one yeast will cause better than the other and, and, and benefit from that. So for instance, uh, the Windsor strain doesn't ferment maltotriose, uh, which is uh, the three uh, glucose sugar that you get in a brewery fermentation. And so you'll get a, a lower attenuation than you normally would. At the same time, Windsor produces a very nice ester character, so it's fruity and uh, it's a nice flavor. So some people would like to have a fermentation that will attenuate to a high degree, but they would like to have the esters from Windsor. So what they would do is they would pitch both at the same time and you'd get the benefit of the ester character from the Windsor strain, but you'd also get the benefit of the high attenuation of, of the other strain that you might use. Uh, I'd probably recommend a neutral ale strain, so either Nottingham or, or BRY97 in this case. Um, so yes, lots of people do co-fermentation. It's actually it, it's something that we've been looking at more and more recently because it's, it's a very interesting uh, area of, of fermentation science. Um, particularly at the moment, I've been talking to people about co-fermentation of, of yeast and bacteria, which produces some really interesting characteristics compared with just kettle souring alone. Um, so that's something that it is really interesting, and, and, do, and lots of people do do it. Um, so that's answered that question. I'm going to wait for some more to come through, if, if they come. Okay, so I'm not getting any more questions through on the Facebook chat. Um, so thank you all for attending. Uh, it's been really, really good for you to, to well, good for me for you to listen to me. Well, thank you very much anyway. <laughs> if you do have any further questions, please don't hesitate to contact me. My email address is apatterson, that's one T, at lalaman.com. So any questions you have, please feel free to contact me. Many thanks, and I'm going to end the stream now. <laughs>